The idea of living a life cut off from your fellow men in order to worship God didn't really get going in the West until around 500 AD, when an Italian by the name of Benedict decided to escape city life and hide himself away in these mountains. Benedict hadn't liked Rome. For his taste, there was far too much eating, drinking and sex and generally having a good time. What he was looking for was a nice cave with no fitted carpets and no plumbing. So he moved in here. He preferred his food to be lowered down to him in a bucket and only once a day. And he didn't want any oyster sauce or deep fried wontons. In fact, he didn't want anything he could enjoy. As far as Benedict was concerned, God placed us on this world so we could refrain from enjoying our time here and concentrate on thanking him for placing us here. It's a curious philosophy, but one which seems to have had a lot of appeal. My soul. Benedict just couldn't keep a good thing like this to himself. And soon there were lots of other would-be hermits joining him so they could not enjoy themselves in solitude together in the company of the great man. If there's one thing hermits like Benedict can't stand, it's overcrowding. And within a few years, he had so many followers sharing his solitude that he decided to organize them into separate communities monasteries, and he wrote a book of rules for monks to follow. According to Benedict, his rules weren't that strict, but he wouldn't let his monks eat red meat, and you weren't supposed to talk at mealtimes. However, Benedict did allow his monks to make a sign if they wanted something like salt. That was the sign. And we know what these signs were because the monks compiled dictionaries of their sign language. For example, we know that the sign for king was this. And God was king in heaven. While the sign for martyr, you may be surprised to learn, was this. And fish was simple. But for some curious reason, herring was this sign. And for some even more curious reason, trout was the sign for herring, followed by this, which is the sign for woman. What Benedict hadn't envisaged was that these simple signs would blossom into an entire language of their own. The same signs were used in monasteries all over Europe, a sort of dumb Esperanto. So whatever country a monk found himself in, he could always convey to a fellow monk exactly what he wanted. St. Benedict's Book of Rules became famous and his monasteries flourished. In the 13th century, one was built on top of Benedict's actual cave. The monastery of San Benedetto perches halfway up the sheer rock face where Benedict sought solitude. I was shown round by the unlikely figure of an Australian monk who came here 41 years ago. So, Father Giovanni, um, can you tell me about this uh, painting over here? Yes, an episode of the life of St. Benedict. Yeah, what's he doing? In one of the monasteries founded by the saint in this valley, there was a lazy monk. Yeah. He didn't want to stand in the chapel during the prayer. It was the devil who was pulling him out, see? <laughs> On the right, you see St. Benedict who cured this lazy monk with a stick, with a hiding. <laughs> he beat him. Not a popular method today, is it? No, no. <laughs> There's St. Benedict during the temptation. See the devil there? He's breathing so far, isn't he? Exactly. Yeah. There's a third devil here. Let's have a look. That's the main devil. Behind bars, is he? He's meant to be kept in prison, is he? Yes. <laughs> Benedict has got him in jail. Exactly. Ah, got him. How, when the monastic movement is really monks are taking themselves away from the world, how is it they've had any effect on the world? <laughs> well, they take themselves away from the world to, to, to conquer the world. Uh, solitude, silence, that's the method, eh? The main work of the monks is prayer. Ora et labor, and not prayer and, and work. The monks had to support themselves and supply their own needs so they could keep their distance from the world. But keeping away from the world was to prove the one thing that monasteries weren't very good at. 
the unworldliness of monks just wasn't destined to last. And ironically, it began to break down because of people's belief in the power of prayer and in the idea that the purer and simpler the life you led, the more likely God was to listen. And since monks were supposed to lead purer and simpler lives than anyone else, their prayers were seen as a hotline to God. Hallelujah. Rich folk and warriors began to pay monks to do all the praying they were too busy to do for themselves. Prayer became a commodity. It gained a commercial value, and that was to prove the undoing of the whole system. It was a pretty rough world outside the monastery wall. After all, fighting men were professionally engaged in the business of breaking commandments, especially that one that said, thou shalt not kill. A warrior's soul was not an easy one to save. In fact, it required a strenuous effort by a significant number of people to pray his way out. After the Battle of Hastings, for example, the church demanded 120 days of penance for everyone killed. William the Conqueror, in his lifetime, must have been responsible for something like mm, 10,000 deaths. That's about 3,300 years of penance. He wouldn't have finished yet, not until the year 4,366. However, if the work was split up amongst a couple of hundred monks, William could have his soul cleansed in less than 18 years. So he founded a string of abbots to pray for his soul. In fact, anyone who had any money would deem it only wise to invest a bit of it in the innocence of monks. And far from living lives of extreme poverty and discomfort, monks began to find themselves as rich as Croesus. Oh, no, no. 